So I just wanted to share with you guys a bit about something I kind of realized at break. Um, I'm only going to take like a minute or two, but I really realized the importance of not taking opportunities we have for granted. And it kind of came to me, I was, I was working for my parents actually in a cabinet shop and just had a lot of time to, to think and reflect and realize I'm going into my last semester of college and that's a little scary. And what do I want to do in this last semester that's going to set it apart and make it different? Um, and a verse came to my mind. It's a verse that I learned when I was in fourth grade. Uh, my teacher actually had it on her wall in a public school, which I thought was just awesome. And so the verse comes from Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, and it reads, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. And this verse really inspires me. And, it, and I was thinking about it a lot over break and just wanted to share it with you guys because it inspires me to dive in deeper, to have a lot more fun, maybe take some things more seriously, really jump outside my comfort zone. And I realized that my comfort zone, and I don't know if this is true for all of you, but I'm going to talk as if it is. So my comfort zone is really like the world's most comfortable recliner. So I'm just sitting there, and I don't know if you guys know the feeling, but when you're just leaning back, just looking up, feet up, the last thing you ever want to do is power your chair up, sit, sink your feet to the floor, and then come up with all the power in the world to lift up out of that chair. And I think that's a lot like how our comfort zones are. The last thing we may want to do at that, at that moment right there is get outside of them. But think about how much more, once you stand up out of your recliner, think about how much more when you just look around you can see and you can be a part of. And really that's what I want, I want us to do. Just think how much more. It is so amazing the opportunities we can have if we just stand up out of our recliner. So I think a great way to do this, and maybe that's just my goal for me, but think of what a goal might be for you. Now this doesn't have to have anything to do with Warner. It has to do with you. You, not your friend. This is a goal for you. And I, I don't need you to think about it right at this second because I think a lot of goals can take some time to develop. But why don't you take like just a couple weeks and you have, it's a 15 week semester. So take these first couple weeks and think about what your goal is going to be for the semester. And then I would encourage you to tell someone. You don't have to tell, it. that person doesn't have to be here. They could be a spouse. They could be a significant other. They could be your best friend. They could be your parent. They could be your brother or your sister or your cousin or any family member. It could be your student body president. Um, and so think of that goal and that person can help keep you accountable and can help you strive for greatness this semester because I think we can really hit greatness this semester. This semester can be the memories that we hold for the rest of our lives. And so let's just not take the opportunities we have for granted. That's really all the time I have right now. I'm going to close and well, I'm going to actually open in prayer. And uh, yeah, and so let's get going. God, I just... I'm, I'm overwhelmed by you and just your presence in our lives and just uh, your desire to have a personal relationship with us. You're mind-boggling, and I think that makes me fall more in love with you. Thank you just so much for the opportunities we have and just for allowing us to gain an education with our friends and be a part of chapel and just be a part of this amazing community and this team, this family. Lord, we love you, and we just pray that our lives are a reflection of that. God, thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. It's uh, great to see you here. It's great to be back uh, on campus. I feel like I've missed the beginning of this semester uh, with being gone for a couple of days, but it's great to be back. I uh, want to say welcome to spring semester, and for some of you, this is it. You seniors... Would you stand up? It, uh, it is always so strange to see you come and go through so fast. And I know maybe it doesn't seem like it to you, but it sure does to me. I just want to say, I'll have an opportunity to say this later, but it has been so good to have you as students here. And we love you. And uh, have a great semester as you finish out this season of your education. Also, I want to mention that we're going to reinstate something that we did for several years and then just kind of took a break because it seemed like it waned a bit. But we're going to start having coffees uh, with the president again this semester. So please come. Okay? Um, I, I don't 
like to have pres coffees with the president, president with just me. Uh, it's kind of boring, and so I'd prefer that you come and that you engage in the conversation. And these are really casual. They're just an opportunity for me to hear from you. Um, you can tell me what you want. You can ask me what you want, and uh, it's just a, a chance for us to spend time together. So you'll see some notices, and those will be announced from here and, and on the TV screen. So I hope you take advantage of that. I wasn't here on Tuesday, and I'm sorry I missed chapel and missed the day I was with all the presidents of the other colleges and universities here in the state of Oregon talking about educational policy and stuff. Uh, it would have been funner, more fun to be here, uh, but that's part of my job, so I needed to show up for that. And then I immediately left that meeting and flew to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and got in there late on Tuesday night and had a meeting with all of the regional pastors of the Church of God on uh, Wednesday morning and then flew back last night. So um, it's good to be here. I also uh, know that our new students were welcomed on Tuesday, but I want to extend my welcome to you as well. And I also want to say welcome to our students who are visiting us today as they compete in the final phase of the Act 6 scholarship competition. This process is rigorous isn't it? For those of you who are here, it's long, and as current Act 6 students can attest, it, uh, it's a lot of work. And um, applicants complete an application, they write several essays, they submit two references, they participate in a phase where they're observed by judges as they work in groups, and then they finally spend these two days here on campus uh, when they are observed and go to class sessions and uh, then, as they come here as students, they are expected to engage in leadership along the way. So please join me in welcoming those that are here as finalists. And would you stand, the, the 21, I believe, finalists that are here? Thank you. You can have a seat. There are few things more powerful than a life well lived. The stories that inspire us are those of women and men who stand up when most people sit down. Those who overcome adversity. Those who demonstrate a passion for the other. Those who rise above the fray and know how to bring peace and order out of chaos. Take, for example, Marcus Mariota. We like Marcus Mariota because he is multifaceted. Yes, he is the incredible Heisman winning quarterback for the Oregon Ducks who just led his team to the national championship game. I wish they would have won. But he is also a great young man who honors his mother and his father. He honors his island. He honors his Polynesian people. And most importantly, he honors Jesus Christ. He lives well. There's something about certain people that raise them up in our view. There are the likes of Abraham Lincoln of Martin Luther King Jr., of Mother Teresa. There are those who see a creative solution in the midst of tension. Gandhi, one of those leaders who put his life on the line in the name of peace, says this about Christians. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. What's interesting is how clearly this resonates with all of us. Both those who would consider them insiders and those who have chosen to remain outsiders to Christianity. It's true that the word Christian in the 21st century Portland, Oregon doesn't bring con positive connotations. The idea of Christian is too easily connected to pol politics and judgmentalism. 
I wonder if the word has lost the hope of Jesus, the good news inherent in the gospel. A few years ago, Warren Pacific actually rewrote the mission statement, in part to change out the word Christian that was previously in the statement to affirm our most true commitment, and that is for our commitment to center everything we do on Jesus Christ. That change was rooted in a conviction. To be Christ-centered is to lift up Jesus as we live and learn together. It is to grow Jesus' people and represent him well in a constantly changing world. It is all about Jesus. He who is fully God and fully man. He who is the central figure of human history. He who is the Prince of Peace. He who is the Alpha and the Omega. He who is both the Lion and the Lamb. And he who is the King of Kings. Jesus. What we know about Jesus is found in this book, the Bible. This is the story that most clearly tells the narrative in narrative form uh, in the Gospels, the story of the life of Jesus. I happen to bring along um, this copy of the Bible. This is the Poverty and Justice Bible. And I want to use it as an example in a few minutes. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all contain, in their various ways, the stories of announcing Jesus as God in public. As John 1.14 says, the word took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And he didn't stay quiet. He wasn't a quiet neighbor. In fact, Jesus came to a broken, fragmented world proclaiming what he calls the kingdom of God. Teaching a message that very much upset the religious establishment. Jesus came to answer the question, what would it look like if God were running the show? This wasn't a theoretical or a hypothetical question. Jesus truly wants to run the show. The trouble is that in our flat earth political philosophies, we only know the spectrum that has tyranny at one end and anarchy at the other, with democracies as our dangerously fragile way of warding off both extremes. God's kingdom is demonstrating something new. He's built a different delivery system. Jesus calls it the church, which is intended to be a love network of God's people representing him as an alternative community. The church. For some of you, those words bring with them a lot of baggage. Recent research done by the Barna Group uncovered the fact that nearly three out of every five young Christians disconnect either permanently or for an extended period of time from church after 15. My sense is that those numbers probably ring true for the demographic of students who are attending Warner Pacific. Many of you are actively involved in your local church still, as am I. And I want to encourage you that church involvement is an integral part of faith development. I saw a Facebook post from Mixie McConnell the other day, and she said, I wish I had a church to connect with where she is across the seas. She said, I took it for granted. I walked away. I wish I had my church to connect with. 
We have amazing local churches in our city, and if you want to learn more about how to get involved in one, please reach out to Michelle or Jess. They can help you connect. Being regularly engaged in Jesus' community is important. However, I'd like to also suggest that we ought to also broaden our understanding of the church's role in our world. I'm worried that we've underdefined the church, and I'm worried that we don't see ourselves correctly as church people. The word church in the New Testament comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means to call out. The only two references of this word in the Gospels are from Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. The first comes from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19, and they read like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, you, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, my, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth on earth will be loosed in heaven. When we think about what it means to live and study in a Christ-centered community, I believe that everything begins and ends with how we answer the question that Jesus asks in this passage. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do you say Jesus is? That is the question for you individually and for the church collectively. The answer to that question is more important than, are you a Christian? Or do you go to church? Or what do you think of religion? The question is, who do you believe Jesus is? In Matthew 16, Peter clearly states Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus's, Jesus affirms Peter's response and states, on this rock, I will build my church. You see, the church is something Jesus is building. He is the one calling people out. The church belongs to Jesus. Therefore, if we belong to Jesus, we are part of the church. What's more, we are given access to the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We are given access to a power from the Holy Spirit that is demonstrative. We are given power to live differently in the face of darkness. At Warner Pacific, when we say we are Christ-centered, what we mean is we see Jesus as the answer. We are part of his church, and he is building something bigger than what can be captured in a religious system or in a building. The church is neither more nor less than people who bear witness by their very existence, that Jesus is the world's true Lord, ridiculous or even scandalous though it may seem to some. The danger, as we all know, is that though we in the West have retained our distinctive Christian witness in some areas, we have undoubtedly compromised it in others. We have caused pain 
and detracted from the message of Christ. I want us to live into the Jesus way. I want us to recapture what it means to be followers of Jesus rather than live constrained by the baggage that is associated with the word Christian. I want us to be justice people. Sometimes when I'm asked about how often I use the word justice by Christians, they say, well, is that really scriptural? I brought this Bible today because it's my poverty and justice Bible. What they did when they published this is that they highlighted in orange every passage that has something to do with poverty and justice. And you cannot flip very many, very many pages without seeing the orange throughout. This was at the heart of God. It's what Jesus was about and is about today. I want you to get active with Jesus and love the world around you. Justice is not just a project or something we talk about when the news catches our attention. Justice is a way of life each and every day. Justice is about participating with God in setting things right in this world. I want you to watch this video. A lot of people see justice as the most futile thing you can do with your life. Give your life completely to business and you see the money piling up. Be a health nut, eat right, go to the gym, and your muscles will grow and your body will look good and you'll see results. But when it comes to justice, it seems like you just can't get ahead. You patch up one hole and something else rips open. You bring peace to one region and war breaks out in another. You rebuild after an earthquake and a tsunami hits. And you work and you work and you work and there's never any profit. There's no bank where you can store a surplus amount of justice in. Stability is never permanent. Something always tips and people always ask, is it even worth it? And that question though understandable, it's, I mean, quite frankly, it's ridiculous. And it rarely comes from those who are actually tired from pursuing justice and not just tired of the idea. It rarely comes from people who've labored for years and have good reason to ask it. And you know what they never ask? Those type of people become friends with those who suffer. Family because it's one thing to wonder if someone else's freedom is worth fighting for. But when you begin to identify with that someone else, commune with them, that's when the question is no longer worth asking. That's when it becomes offensive even. What do you mean, is it worth my time? That doesn't even deserve an answer. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how many times you fail. I don't care how little progress is made. You never stop fighting for your own. You see, I want you to live a full relational life. Jesus promised that those who follow him would experience fullness in the pursuit of justice. This is what the church as Jesus defined it, is all about. Jesus is building the church to head into the fray, and that's the adventure that I want you to participate in. The way the church is supposed to show up in this world is not by a sneering, holier-than-thou attitude, but by providing such a wonderful model of God's genuine humanity that the world is seen as sordid and shabby in contrast and a, a place of lies and death instead of truth and life that Jesus came to offer. N.T. Wright, in his book Surprised by Scripture, writes, The world thinks it knows what justice is, but again and again the world gets it wrong. 
favoring the rich and powerful, turning a blind eye to wickedness in high places, forgetting the cry of the poor and the needy, who the Bible insists are special objects of God's just and right care. So the church, in the power of the Spirit, has to speak up for God's justice. In the light of Jesus' ascension to the throne of the world, and to draw the world's attention to where it's getting it wrong. We never know what situations we will meet around the corner. But that isn't the source of Christian hope or Christian confidence. Our hope and our confidence come from knowing who it is we're following. At Warner Pacific, we are asking you to consider following King Jesus and to join his cause. Join the movement of the church. We work together, we study together, and we live together, and I say we should all collectively fight together for justice. Jesus is calling you. He's calling us, and that's a life well lived. Let's pray. Lord, we've gotten it wrong so many times, and we've hurt so many people. And we confess to you, Lord, our sin of hubris and pride. We ask that you'd forgive us and that we would come to understand that justice and mercy are at the very heart of God. Lord, give us this semester a new focus on what it means to be the church, to be followers of Jesus. As it says in Micah 6, Lord, you have told us what is good. And what does the Lord require of us? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Cook. There are times when being in the, this Warner community when justice is not something out in the future that we're preparing you for or out in our city that you can go to and come back, but right here in our community and right in our own hearts, we have the opportunity to engage justice and, and some conversation right now in our Warner community. Dr. Glenn, our Vice President of Community Life and our Chief Diversity Officer, it's going to come to take a moment and talk about a perspective and some opportunities that we have here. Good morning, everybody. Come on, y'all. I need a little bit of energy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Brothers and sisters, for real, I want to talk to you very deeply and profoundly for about three minutes. Um, something came to my attention. It was brought to me. It was brought to my office that I thought we needed to talk about briefly as a community. And oftentimes when you hear my voice um, on this stage, on this mic, um, in, in spaces like this, it's always a response to something that may be problematic or may have the potential to help us uh, become a better community. And I think depending on how your, your, your spirit is organized today, you may interpret it um, either of those ways. But here's the situation. It was brought to my attention that in the sub, we have a bulletin board where we share what's going on in our community, ways for people to get involved, ways for people to be engaged, and ways for people to just talk about um, issues that are going on in our community that if we think critically and profoundly about, it can help us build a more vibrant community here on campus. And so the particular bulletin uh, display had on it, Black Lives Matter. And for those that don't know what, where that slogan kind of originated from, it originated from what was going on in Ferguson, and subsequently what was happening uh, in New York with the, the death of Eric Gardner. 
So there, there's been this kind of uh, national response to Black Lives Matter. And so what some people did, um, some students, they, they articulated that and kind of in memoriam um, put on this bulletin board some of the lives that were lost, um, some unjustly, right? And so we as a community were saying Black Lives Matter. We as followers of Christ recognize that there are certain groups that may disproportionately experience injustice and we want them to know that they matter. What was done to this bulletin board was um, vandalism. It was defaced. It was the faces of, or the outlines of the black males who we've lost, their faces were erased, um, literally. And over their faces, someone put all lives matter as to suggest that to say that just black lives matter, there's a critique that all lives don't matter. And that's not what the sentiment was. So a couple things are happening here. One is vandalism, defacing something. That's not something that's gonna be accepted in this community as we work together to flourish, to thrive, and to reach our potential. So I have a critique on the vandalism that took place. Another thing that I'm really concerned about is if the person or people who defaced that bulletin board are really concerned in their heart and their spirit are organized because they wanna have a conversation about all lives matter and I'm confused as to why we would identify just one particular group, that's a great question. And there are spaces and opportunities and outlets for that conversation, but when you do that by defacing something that means so much to different people in this community, I have a hard time believing that your intentions and your motives were just. We gotta do better. I think on the heels of Dr. Cook's talk, the worship, the everything, we have to do better. And I'm getting tired of every time you see my face and hear my voice, I have to respond reactively to something that is insidious and that shouldn't take place. If that's our posture as a community, it's gonna be a hard time for us living into, living into our potential. So I wanna get in front of these kind of issues. I wanna get in front of these kind of topics and I want you to ask the questions from a great place, from your heart, so we can dialogue about them, okay? So what have we put together? Next Thursday, a week from today, from 11 o'clock to one o'clock. In one of the classrooms in the cafeteria, um, TBA, Student Diversity Council, Black Student Organization, and other committed leaders on campus are gonna come together to have a conversation about what do we mean by community, how are we educating about justice, and how do we identify particular historically marginalized groups, bring their suffering to our attention, and still understand that that doesn't mean we don't care about everybody. That's a profound and educational conversation that needs to take place. But malicious acts of um, defaming, defacing, and vandalism will not be tolerated. So in love and in community, step your game up if you got some issues with something and be a leader to bring it to the folks where we can really dialogue and think critically together. Is that all right? Is that a fair ask? All right, y'all. So next Thursday, if you want to be a part of the conversation, 11 to 1 in the cafeteria. And let's just be our best and live into our potential in this season. Thank you very much. Pray together. Lord God, in this new season and in these new ways, we find ourselves as a community proclaiming we are committed to you. We're thankful that you are invested here. We put before you um, the needs and the hopes of this community. Um, I thank you for the education that we all are getting and how to be people uh, that love Jesus and see, their, and see justice play out in the world that we live in. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we gather here today, that we've worshiped, that we pray, um, and that we go from here as just people. Amen. Go in peace, you're dismissed.